Welcome to part two, projected climate change in BC. And so we're looking again at this slide that we ended the last section with, uh, where we're looking at the temperature in British Columbia. So we're averaging over all of the land of British Columbia. Uh, and if we do that, average the temperature for each year, historically you get this black squiggly line where you have some, some warm years, some cold years. Uh, those numbers are the difference from the 1971 to 2000 average. Uh, and if you look at the difference between the cold years and warm years, you'll see that there's about two or three degrees. That doesn't sound like a lot, but when you average over the entire province and average over the entire year, uh, it takes a lot to, uh, you need a very warm spell or a lot of warm spells uh, throughout a year to really, to move that, that number um, away from, from zero. So the difference between uh, one of these years that's a degree or two warmer than normal and a year that's a degree or two colder than normal is quite a big difference. Uh, some of those warmest years on record are associated with things like the 2003 Kelowna wildfire year. Um, you'll see the last two years there uh, on, that are shown are 2017, 2018, and those were record-breaking warm years uh, at the time. And uh, the difference between that and some of the cold years, there'd be big impacts on the landscape during those cold years too, like uh, a flooding in the Fraser is something that would often happen after, during a very cold year, where you accumulate a lot of snow uh, over this large basin and it all melts during the spring and, and you end up with flooding in the Fraser. So big impacts, big difference between a couple of degrees. And that's important context when we start looking at the future projections. Uh, so. If, we, if you look at that, those squiggly lines and think about it as a distribution, so a sort of normal distribution, I'm going to put this, this image down there. So you see you have some of the years that are the, the hot years, some years that are they're colder than normal, and then most years are kind of in the middle. If we follow these three future projections, uh, these are from a set of climate models uh, that are run under different emissions, uh, different greenhouse gas emission scenarios into the future, and we'll get into the differences among those in a moment. But let's just focus on the, the top one. So this is kind of business as usual. We don't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by very much. Uh, and globally, this is about three and a half degrees of warming. So, so this is, uh, you don't hear even a lot about, about this scenario, uh, but this is, this is kind of business as usual. If we do follow this scenario right through to the end of the century and we kind of slide that, that bell curve up there uh, and just following the, the, the dark red line there being the, the, average of, um, the average of interannual variability and the average of multiple climate model runs, that, uh, that bell curve doesn't overlap at all with the historical bell curve. So if you can imagine sort of sliding um, uh, a line in between the bottom of this end of the century curve and, and the historical curve. There's just no overlap. Um, so this is really a different, a completely different place. Uh, this BC has not been this warm for at least tens of thousands of years, uh, probably millions of years. Um, it's just lack of paleoclimate records that makes it impossible to know it, uh, when exactly, if ever, we've been that warm in BC. Uh, but again, just to restate this in, in, a, in a different way, Think of these record-breaking hot years that we've just had that have been these last couple of years that have been associated with, with uh, uh, large wildfires. Again, not necessarily a direct cause, but there's a relationship there. Imagine that's not the new average, but actually that's the abnormally cold year, oddly cold, and the, the normal is considerably warmer than that. Uh, and then the warm years are much warmer than that. So, so that's a big difference from, from today. Um, again, luckily, this is the sort of worst case scenario, the one that uh, if we are successful with reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to avoid. Um, but it's important to understand um, sort of the magnitude of change that we're talking about, especially by the end of the century. Uh, on the other hand, if we follow one of these uh, two other trajectories, the yellow or the blue line, uh, we're looking at considerably less warming towards the end of the century. Uh, but still, uh, still a considerable amount of warming. So just to describe these, these two and how they differ from, from the red line, uh, oh, they all have names, so these are fairly technical names. The red line is RCP 8.5, um, that just the number has to do with uh, forcing at the top of the atmosphere watts per square meter. Um, the important part is that it represents minor, sort of minor effort in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and about three and a half degrees of warming globally by the end of the century. Uh, now in BC, that's more. Uh, you can see the, the middle line there is about six degrees of warming. Uh, we're looking at 
uh, land mass in the um, you know in the mid latitudes and the way that global warming compares to land warming is that you know a lot of the planet is ocean and the ocean actually warms slower than land um, so part of the reason that the warming in BC is larger than the, the global number is because we're, we're looking at all land here uh, and the other part is that as you go from sort of the tropics towards the poles you also tend to have larger uh, warming so and we're kind of mid mid latitudes uh, so so that three and a half globally translates into about six degrees in BC and you'll see something similar happen with the uh, with the other numbers. There's also a difference in the baselines, uh, but uh, I'll leave that for the keeners to, to sort out. Okay, so the yellow line is if you add up all of the commitments that were made in Paris a few years ago, and if every country was successful at making those commitments, we would land around this RCP 4.5 or around two degrees of warming uh, from pre-industrial globally. And again, that's associated with, uh, you look at about three degrees of warming in BC. The blue line, the, the best case scenario, uh, this, is the, this is the goal. This is more the, sort of the aspirational goal. Canada has committed to this goal. Uh, though, again, we haven't figured out actions to quite get us there. The, you know, our actions we're, we're aiming at the yellow line, um, but we acknowledge that the blue line is where we need to be heading. Uh, and it's kind of globally, that's sort of on the same uh, footing where it's recognized as an aspirational goal. We really should be aiming for that. Uh, and the, there was a report that came out last year that described the differences between 1.5 and 2 degrees and really outlined that the, the difference in impacts between 1.5 degrees globally and 2 degrees globally, it is, it's worth it to uh, you know, do what we can to hit that 1.5 degrees. Now, what does that all mean for adaptation? Uh, there's a big difference between two degrees w of warming under this, uh, you know, this, this best case scenario. Uh, and in, in fact, in this blue line, we actually stabilize. There is such a thing as a new normal. Uh, once we get past about 2050, you know, that new normal is comparable to the warmest of the warm years that we've, you know, it's, it's record breaking warm. So it's still a very different climate from today's climate, um, but at least does stabilize. The other two lines, even the, uh, uh, even the yellow line, the, the two degree global line, uh, climate is still changing at the end of the century. So there's not even really such thing as a, as a new normal. Uh, so how do you deal with that for adaptation? Well, generally, we tend to focus on the middle of the century uh, in terms of adapting to climate change. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at the middle of the century and make a couple of assumptions. So if we look at the business as usual uh, line there, this is the worst case scenario. Um, but we, there's not as much time between now and 2050s. By the end of the century, hopefully we, we figure out how to aim at that yellow or even better, the blue line. Um, but by middle of the century, this is now only 30 years from now, so uh, we might not get there yet. And so the, the sort of con engineering conservative uh, kind of thing to do, sort of plan for the worst case scenario would be to plan for that yellow line, or sorry, <laughs> plan for the red line. Um, if you f sort of follow uh, over, if you look at the red line at 2050 and then follow over till you hit the yellow line, it's kind of equivalent if you plan for RCP 8.5 2050s, it's kind of equivalent to planning for RCP, RCP 4.5 2070s. So you can think of that either way that you want to. You're either, if you use the, the RCP 8.5 2050s, um, if we manage to hit the yellow line instead, you're kind of already adapted to 2070 instead of 2050. Um, so you, you, the plans you put in place to adapt to that red line at 2050 will last a little longer. Um, in the case that we managed to hit this blue line, and there's some academic debate about whether this is even possible. Um, so for adaptation, we don't focus too much on that, at least for the middle of the century especially. Uh, if we manage to do that, we might have over-adapted, and that's you know, kind of a good problem to have probably. Um, so again, for adaptation, we tend to focus on middle of the century and that, that red line. What does this mean compared to current practice? And this, this is an example from the BC Building Code, but uh, any sector, agriculture uh, or, or any sector will have some version of this. That, so if you look in the Building Code, what's currently used for current conditions uh, is 1986 to 2005. And so if you look at that, that horizontal black line, that's the period that's currently used as sort of current conditions in the, in the building code. But we're building buildings that are meant to last for 50, 70, 100 years. Uh, and if you look over sort of horizontally from that, that solid black line, uh, 
over to the 2050s, you can see that those conditions are not, um, you know, those don't really indicate what, what is any, in any of the range of likely outcomes. Even, the, uh, even on the coldest side of the blue uh, band, uh, the historical conditions are, are colder than that. So they don't really well represent uh, what we can expect in, in BC in, in the middle of the century. So even though there's some uncertainty, you have to make some assumptions around which scenario are we following, whatever you do in, in terms of those assumptions is going to be better than relying only on historical information because we know that that doesn't take into account any of the range of possibilities. All right, so what does this mean in BC? Uh, it tends to fall into a few kind of categories of impacts. Uh, Vancouver has produced these uh, nice info infographics based on uh, projections where, you know, now we're moving from BC down to locally specific uh, projections. And uh, uh, so for summer, hotter and drier summer, uh, and th this is based on uh, Vancouver specific projections. Uh, and so they have one infographic for each season. So for autumn, it's, uh, it's wetter, 21% uh, more rain on, um, on wet days. Uh, for winter, what really matters for Vancouver, uh, although the water supply isn't in the city of Vancouver, um, the city depends on the uh, snowpack uh, in the watershed for water supply, and so a 58% decrease in snowpack by um, the middle of the century is, is a big concern for, for the water supply. Uh, and there's an icon for skiing there too, will uh, threaten, threaten some winter activities. Uh, and then warmer springs. So here, uh, this is talking about um, you know decrease in frost days. So this is potentially a good news for uh, for home gardeners certainly, and maybe, and for some agriculture that uh, uh, you know a decrease in frost days. This could mean some new crops. Um, again, there's a trade-off though with the sort of hotter, drier summers. So can we find crops that uh, can take advantage of the decrease in frost days that we'll expect? Won't won't have problems with uh, hotter, drier summers or or wetter wetter autumns. Right. So again, taking future climate into account is uh, necessary and possible. Uh, these are the two main messages from this uh, series. And uh, just to review again, those what we've looked at for Vancouver. If you look at that anywhere in the province, we tend to have impacts falling into these same categories. So this is actually for uh, capital regional district. Uh, again, they looked at projections. Uh, we provided projections for the regional district, and these came out as sort of the four most important things. Uh, warmer winter temperatures, fewer days below freezing, uh, more extreme hot days in summer, longer dry spells in summer months, uh, more precipitation throughout the wet season, so in every season but summer, uh, and then an increased frequency and intensity of precipitation and storm events. So uh, you'll find slightly different things in different parts of the province, but these, are, these tend to be the, the, the sort of main impacts anywhere. So we're going to go now into a little more detail uh, on each of some of these kinds of impacts. Okay, so first we'll look at more frequent and more intense wet days. And the way we'll do this, I'm going to look show some examples of uh, some actual recent events uh, along these lines. So in Bella Coola, September 2010, uh, we had this one in 200 year event, uh, wiped out the airport. Uh, it was a big uh, problem for Bella Coola for several days. Transportation in and out of, of Bella Coola were uh, severely messed up, as you can see. And now what I'm going to do is look at um, future projections for... Now, we don't, we don't have the 1 in 200 year event available to us for uh, sort of various uh, technical reasons, but we can get close. So here's the closest thing to that. Um, this is just the precipitation on um, wet days. So if you look at the amount of precipitation that falls in the sort of 5% of wettest days in the past, uh, and then look at how much precipitation falls on days with that same threshold in future. Uh, now here we're looking at uh, we're looking at Vancouver, and the increase in that is about 25 percent by the the middle of the century. So quite a considerable increase in in wet days. Now it's not the one in 200 year event, um, but it gives us an, an indication of a fairly considerable increase in extreme precipitation. Similarly for decreased snowpack. Uh, so this example is from Metro Vancouver. Uh, summer of 2015, where there were water restrictions because of, of decreased snowpack. And as I uh, sort of mentioned this earlier in the Vancouver infographic, uh, but here's a spatial image of it, the, the decreased snowpack by the middle of the century. So it's uh, about a 
uh, reduction in the those three areas there, the watershed boundaries. Now, looking at how, what this means for stream flow, uh, so here's a bunch of things. Uh, here's the image of a higher winter stream flow um, resulting from uh, precipitation falling as rain when it normally would have been falling as snow. Uh, we're also looking at lower and earlier peaks uh, and lower summer stream flow. So these three examples come from, from different events, um, but they're indicative, uh, and different places in fact, but they're indicative of the kinds of things we expect under future, uh, future climate change. So here's, here's what we have for future stream flow. Um, and this is for the Peace River at Taylor, so up in the northeastern part of the province. And the black, so what we're looking at here, the black line is the, the annual stream flow, so the amount of, the amount of water in the river um, throughout the calendar year. And so it's low, just looking at the black line first, it's low uh, in the beginning of the year because uh, any precipitation that falls tends to fall as snowpack, it's cold. Uh, and then as you get into, you know, into May, June, uh, that, that snowpack that accumulated during the winter starts to melt. So you have large stream flow and you have the, you know, the peak happening there in June historically. Um, continue to have snow melt throughout the summer and any rain that falls uh, now goes kind of right into the stream. So you still have continued fairly high stream flow throughout the summer. And then as you get into um, the fall and, uh, and winter, again, you start having a larger fraction of precipitation falling as snow. So it starts to accumulate rather than go straight into the stream. Now, if you then look at the future projections, so first the blue line is 2020s, black line, or sorry, the green line is 2050s, and the pink line is 2080s. You see this progression and sort of three, the three things that I showed on the images before. Uh, so higher winter stream flow, just caused by precipitation that used to fall as snow, now falling as rain as temperatures get warmer and warmer. Uh, and then you get this lower and earlier peak. So you have, if you look at the 2080s, the peak that now occurs in May is higher stream flow for that time of year. So high, the, the peak there in the, in the pink line is higher than the black line for May. So it's, it's actually higher for May, um, but the peak itself is considerably lower than the June peak used to be. So that stream flow peak's happening earlier, and so it's, it's high for that time of year and, and earlier, um, but lower peak total. And then considerably lower stream flow in the summer uh, as there's just less snowpack to melt. And you can see, um, see the effect of that. Now this, this, these same three sorts of things will happen kind of wherever you are in the province, but to varying degrees, depending on how much uh, the, a watershed is, is already snowpack driven or you know, down on the, the coast uh, and lower mainland we have some, some areas that are uh, already somewhat rain dominated uh, today, so they'll change much more rapidly. Okay, so another one of the impacts we saw was uh, fewer cold days. So this is an example. Uh, so from the central interior, one of the things we've seen from fewer cold days is uh, the mountain pine beetle outbreak. Uh, and again, the, I'm showing a, an actual impact that's already occurred that's related to climate change. And then we're looking at a future projection that is as closely related as we can get. So we don't have... Uh, the, the mountain pine, pine beetle outbreak cares about sort of the number of days below 40 Celsius. Uh, that's not what we're looking at here. We're looking at something related. We're looking at the number of days below freezing uh, for, this is sort of the central interior. And uh, you can see, it's hard, you kind of have to look back and forth very closely at the colors between these, these two maps um, to, to really see this come out. But on average in these two regional districts here, the we're going from historically to about 220 days per year below freezing, so you know, about two thirds of the year, to almost two months fewer uh, days below freezing. So that's a pretty considerable change, and in terms of agriculture, that's going to be a big difference in, in terms of what, uh, what crops uh, are going to be suitable in future. Uh, big ecosystem impacts to that as well. And so on the flip side, hot days, uh, and so we saw this, this was just uh, in the last couple of years, we've had a lot of, of uh, extreme heat war warnings in the lower mainland. Uh, here we're actually looking at for the future projection, this is uh, up the coast in Terrace, so not somewhere that you would really necessarily associate with uh, extreme heat, but um, so historically 
uh, right in Terrace, the, on average, you'd only get one day per year above 25 Celsius. Um, but in future, on the, on the right-hand side there, you can see an increase of plus seven. So over a week uh, of, of, of days above 25 Celsius in Terrace, on average, a place that basically you know, had, had, almost didn't have any in the past. So again, that's, that's a, a big difference. All right, so just a reminder, taking future climate into account is necessary and possible. So we've seen a bunch of different impacts of things that we can expect uh, that are similar to things we've seen already, but just happening more frequently or perhaps more intense. And uh, just to give you a flavor of the kinds of impacts that BC will be expecting. And although it may seem overwhelming, there's a bunch of different kinds of things we've looked at. I uh, just wanted to wrap this up with a reminder that uh, really the reason we're looking at all of these things is uh, because taking future climate into account is necessary and it's possible. We have this information like these kind of local projections that can be used to take future climate into account. Mm -hmm.